Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us which, for a conversation I'm really excited about because carbon offsets uh, are often, you know, talked about as the, the key, you know, they're the, the way that businesses can easily reduce emissions by buying um, credits from other projects, but so often they just don't turn out to be what they promise. And I've got two, three experts here today to talk with me about the evolution of carbon markets, where they've been and where they're going. Um, and I think, I'm, you know, when we talk about carbon offsets, one of the things that's so interesting is uh, that there's big questions around the supply side, but also around what buyers are doing with offsets. But I want to start with you, Mark, because you've been involved with carbon offsets and carbon markets in one form or another for the last two decades. So how have you seen the market evolve over that time to where we are today? I'm sure that's a half an hour answer in itself, but if you could briefly give the audience an overview of where we've come from. So like, I suppose, like biological evolution, it's not been a linear process. It's been up and down. There have been moments of extreme enthusiasm after the Kyoto Protocol uh, was signed in 1997. There were people who were almost suggesting that the clean development mechanism would solve not only the climate crisis, but also the world's sustainable development and all other problems that you could think of. Uh, there was then slow down because it took a long time for parties to agree and governments to agree. The European Emissions Trading Scheme suddenly said, ah, kind of suggested trading could work. But it's been very bumpy. I think the clean development mechanism suffered from bureaucracy, over, over, you know, too much bureaucracy, but also lack of scrutiny and I think that is something and I hope we come back to this one of the challenges that carbon markets and particularly voluntary carbon markets has faced is a lack of transparency which makes it hard for people to say to see is this market serving its public purpose i.e. Addition, reducing additional greenhouse gas emissions and channeling additional finance or is it just moving bits of paper around on a table and generating profits without actually adding benefit so I, I think we're moving it means we're, move, we're now moving to something that will be integrity and credibility driven because I think, and I suspect my colleagues will say the same, that that is the basis of trust and without that the market can't grow. And it's often described as a kind of Wild West market. Would you agree with that? I think that's overplaying it a little bit. I mean, it, it's true there aren't single standards and a lot of the verification and validation is outsourced to the market. And the, but there are standards. There are registries, there are platforms where you can see what projects are, which projects are taking place, where the pricing is. I think where it's pro probably the Wild West bit may be more apt is in some of the countries where projects take place that just don't have the legal and institutional infrastructure to monitor, to verify, to check the projects are doing what they should be doing. And that's not just true of carbon markets, that's true of a lot of investments. And so I think strengthening that capacity will overcome a lot of that problem. And Claire, there's a, there's a difference between carbon offsets, which are entirely voluntary, and regulated carbon markets like the EU ETS. From, the, from a stock exchange perspective, is there any way that you can introduce rules from the supply side to try and, to try and make sure that there is some integrity and quality in, in this market, or is it just too difficult? Um, well, that... That actually just is exactly what we're trying to do at the moment, actually, um, from, the, from the stock exchange's perspective, because we think that actually the voluntary carbon markets really present sort of an opportunity to support the transition and, and also to help to support um, financing in, in, into projects, particularly sort of in the develop, developing countries. And it does give sort of that you know, opportunity to be able to bring the activities that have been happening sort of in the, in the OTC markets into sort of the public arena. So we, we announced um, at COP26 that we were looking at how we would be able to facilitate the listing of carbon funds on the London Stock Exchange's markets. So a lot of focus has been placed on um, the trading or you know, the, the demand side. But actually what we're looking to do is that bottleneck of supply side. How can we actually create a market environment and, and structure to be able to support the listing of funds that are investing in projects, predominantly in the Global South, that then would enter into the London Stock Exchange's regulatory environment with an additional designation around that that gives more confidence and clarity, goes to your points around integrity um, and visibility to the market, um, which is what is, is much needed. And in turn, this will enable the... Um, creation of carbon credits in, a, in the form of a dividend in specie. So we're really trying to address that bottleneck situation of the, the supply side. And almost six months on since COP26, how's that project going? 
it's going well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of momentum building. Um, we've spent um, a lot of time um, consulting with the market, um, with industry experts, and actually shaping what we think the, the regulatory environment should look like. Um, and so we hope in, in Q2 that we would actually be able to go out with a, a public market consultation on the rules for this designation, um, and then hopefully look to, uh, to welcome some funds um, to the market um, later in the year. And do you feel um, pressure in terms of when you look at um, markets around the world? In Singapore, they've launched a carbon exchange, uh, I think in Chicago as well. And when I saw yesterday, yes, yeah. yeah. Do, you feel, do you feel that there's pressure to keep up or are you collaborating with them? How, how does it work? I, I think we're, we're very focused. We're, we're participating in a very different part of the market. And I think, you know, we were talking in the green room earlier, weren't there? There's a lot of room for, um, for scope and development in each part of that sort of ecosystem of the life of, of, a, of a carbon credit. And I think what, what we've identified and really sort of laser focused on is how can we support the financing? How can we play to the strengths of an exchange? You know, and the role of the exchange is about bringing capital to those that need capital. To, and this, point, this plays exactly to that because by creating a fund environment to list the, these projects, you know, we hope that actually it will be um, really addressing those two, ch two challenges that we've identified as being scaling finance into the market and, and supply mm. of the credits. And there's also, um, over the last 18 months, there's been a, a task force with, at one point, had a, about 450 people working on it to try and scale the market for voluntary offsets. And part of the aim of that is to develop a set of core carbon principles that you could then stick on like a label, like an organic label, and say, this is a high quality offset. Is that something that you could see the LSE using? Well, I, I actually think, you know, the work that the Integrity Council, Voluntary Car Markets and the VCEMI have also, you know, all been doing is actually really integral to how we can have a, an environment that is, you know, very robust and transparent. Um, and I think what, what we're doing, you know, supports that because bringing sort of into the public market domain brings with it a sense of disclosure and transparency and, and, and governance and brings actually into the market abuse regulation as well. So you're naturally getting you know, a, a lot more... Um, focus that will be placed. I think what we're, we're going to make sure that we're keen to do is align with a lot of the standards um, that are in the marketplace to ensure you know, that those projects that comprise those funds um, are, are, are focused on setting out an investment mandates, that they are uh, investing in projects that create carbon credits and in which sort of standard bodies that those projects are aligned to. Great. And I'd just like to remind the audience that there's a QR code if you have any questions, we'd love to hear them. Um, we'll ask them at the end of the session. So please do scan the QR code and Meg over here will ask them on your behalf. Um, Ariel, Claire was talking about the importance of uh, the money from offsets flowing into the global south, to the countries that need it most. Um, one of the big issues with carbon markets is there's a huge number of incredibly cheap projects which tend to be the ones that get bought up and they often don't actually deliver on the carbon savings that are genuinely needed. So how do you think carbon markets can um, invest in what's needed most rather than just what's cheapest and then claiming that they're, they're carbon neutral? It's a great question. Look, carbon markets are like really any other commodity markets. You have a supply stack of opportunities. And my view is just because they're cheap doesn't mean they're low quality. Um, Things become cheaper or more expensive over time, depending on scarcity and technological improvements. Um, so I think a lot of the legacy offsets that are coming from renewable projects, you know, that are still in the market because they registered before, you know, that cutoff date came on and they were additional at the time, that problem is going to work itself out just simply by the projects ceasing to exist because everything has a fixed end date. Um, you know, our perspective really is that you know buyers are getting really smart around additionality, uh, things like energy efficiency, uh, destruction of HFC gases, uh, you know, in the beginning of the CDM, uh, whether or not they should have been allowed for compliance in the EU ETS is a separate question, but without a carbon price and an incentive, there's very little reason of why somebody would go and, and, and make an investment uh, that would otherwise cost them money. So that basic tenet of additionality, uh, I think, is really the lens through which we need to look at these opportunities. Uh, and, you know, we think in order to maximize the chances that we have to get on a path towards net zero, by definition, we need to direct capital to the opportunities that are most cost effective and from a risk adjustment standpoint. So things like ending deforestation, 
um, and our, from my perspective, kind of uh, large scale, uh, low cost carbon removals from nature, energy efficiency, renewables, which now don't need a carbon market but are in the money. Uh, if you think about the finite pot of capital that we have, uh, you want to make sure you're getting as many emission reductions as possible. Uh, otherwise, you end up with a scenario that you put capital to work in a, in, in a part of the curve or in, with a certain set of technologies that are maybe not commercially viable. So when you say your uh, buyers are getting smart about additionality, yeah. what kind of questions are they asking you now that they didn't previously? Did they just used to come to you and say, we want offsets? Yeah, they we would say, what's the cheapest, they say, yeah, what's the cheapest credit we can get? Where, you know, whether a credit is able to be issued under the rules that existed at the time of registration is now being you know, evaluated versus what is the reality today on the ground. So even though I think people are not questioning that whether those credits exist or should exist or they're fake credits, but they're saying, do I as a company want to put my reputation at risk by retiring a renewable credit in 2024 um, based off of the additionality test of 10 years ago, mm -hmm. where before they're saying, okay, well, Vera has issued it or the CDM has issued it and that's good enough for me. And because this is now voluntary, grassroots, really organic and a lot stronger from my perspective than kind of this artificial demand that the EU ETS represented, uh, reputation, quality and integrity matters almost more than anything else for these companies. Um, so what more about, so than price, believe it or not. What about renewable energy projects? Because when you look at offsets, you've got different kinds of offsets. You've yeah. got offsets which will avoid emissions from being sure. released, so you've got offsets that will remove emissions. Yeah. Um, renewable energy projects now compared to 10 years ago are so cheap that many people argue they shouldn't be even sold as offsets. Do you, do you agree with that? It's, it's not an argument. You can't register a renewable project as a, as, a pro, as a carbon project, so the rules have been changed. The only exception to your comment on Global South is if that renewable project is in a least developed country because there's so many obvious co-benefits you know, and societal benefits of having that project, large scale, small scale, it doesn't matter. If it's in a least developed country, you, know, you, you, can, you can get carbon offsets for that. But my personal opinion is if you would build a renewable project without a carbon revenue, it's not additional. And the reality is we're seeing a huge amount of renewables deployed around the world. The, sp the pace needs to pick up. Um, but objectively, you, know, you are better off investing into renewables even before the war. Uh, than you would on generation fired by coal, uh, oil, or natural gas. And if someone came to you uh, after this conference and said, I want to invest in the best quality project that's going to, you know, the best technology in the best country, what would, you, what would you tell them? Well, what I would say is, first of all, it doesn't exist. A lot of people talk about removal projects. The best removal project today started 10 years ago, right? So the, from my perspective, you know, the, the best, best, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to achieve, but... When you think about avoidance versus removals, clearly the market is heading towards removals, and removals will be needed to get to net zero as opposed to carbon neutral by definition. Um, you know, and from our perspective, really, what will the market will really start to price uh, permanence and durability of the storage in a really much in a much more sophisticated way, because afforestation, as we know, is very effective, very cheap in in, in, in removing, but not so much in storing, because things can burn down. Soil carbon is the same. Uh, so I think highly durable um, carbon removal projects, potentially that have a nature element like bioengineered carbon capture storage, biochar, that, re that, that are basically removing carbon at a relatively low cost and then storing it in a way that's highly durable um, and really kind of maximizing permanence. Uh, that's, that's where we put our chips. Do you want to chip in? So while, while I absolutely agree with Aaron on the point about that focus on permanence, I think when we talk about additionality, and I think this is something I'm trying to allude to at the beginning, we need to think about additionality not only at the project level, but at the market as a whole. Sure. The, the market has to go above and beyond what policy drives and above and beyond the decarbonisation obligations of companies. It can't undermine that and it can't be a substitute for it. So it's got to be the above and beyond, not the instead of. And on your point about high quality carbon credits, I think the underlying quality of a credit is, is it additional and is it, is it permanent and all the rest of it. But when we think about the additionality of the market, and this is why I think sort of the lowest cost is not necessarily the right option. So if we're thinking about a country, uh, however good quality the underlying credit is, if a country has to meet its NDC, its national obligation, if it is selling off the cheap options and leaving itself with the more expensive options, that may undermine its ability to meet its targets and go beyond in the future. Also, if we think about where we want the investment, the investment's needed in those technologies and techniques 
that are not easy to do at the moment. We want to, how do we drive more technological change? And that's not to say that we shouldn't be looking to reduce costs. One of the reasons the EU ETS has been reasonably successful is it's reduced compliance costs for the companies that are operating within the system. But this is not just about cost reduction. It's got to be about transformational change. It's got to be investment in where the host countries most need it and be part of perhaps a blend of different sources of capital that can drive a just transition. So I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with the economic efficiency argument of it, but that's not the only argument. It, this is a market that exists fundamentally, if not exclusively, with a public purpose, and that's to get us to a net zero as easily as we can. I, I agree with everything you said. What, what we found when we do a lot of research on this is that most of the co-benefits that you're referring to translate into the price. So an area with high biodiversity has a big carbon stock, and the marginal cost of avoiding or removing carbon is lower. Areas that have very low GDP per capita, low human development indicators, have a very low bar for additionality because a $10 price changes somebody's future, right? Where if you're trying to do that same project in Norway, uh, it's not additional. It doesn't move the needle. So in a, that's why I said risk-adjusted price. When you risk-adjust the price, it takes all of that into account in most examples. <laughs> So we, we have a story in the, um, in the latest Green Magazine, which I hope you get a chance to read, about a company in the US that's trying to now, have, having made quite a lot of money off of cheap carbon offsets, is now trying to sell credits at $60 a tonne. Do, do you think that's a realistic price mark? Would anyone pay for it? Well, if, I mean, you've almost answered the question, if people are prepared to pay for it. Yes. Yes, it, yes of course, it's a realistic price. And I think the price is not the only variable. I mean, if, if the if the entrepreneur or the broker is buying the credits for $2 and selling them for 60, well then that's $58 a profit that's not going back into the climate. If that $58 actually stayed with the local community or was reinvested in helping the host country meet its climate priorities, then bring $60 on. So I want to talk a bit about the buyers as well because uh, if anyone who's been following this, uh, the evolution of this market in the last couple of years will know there's a lot of acronyms to keep up with. And you're now involved with the VCMI, uh, voluntary Carbon Markets Initiative. So what's, the, what's your main objective with, with this group and how is it different to perhaps the, the, the task force on scaling voluntary markets, which now seems to have evolved into an integrity council on voluntary markets? So for those who are a bit older, it's like the People's Front of Integrity and the Integrity People's Front. But, um, so uh, the difference is the ICVCM is looking at the supply side. So everything from the germ of an idea about a project through to the validation and verification issuance of credits until that credit goes into the market. The VCMI is looking at what, what, is, what guidance should there be for com companies on how they make use of those credits, when they make use of credits, and probably most importantly, what they can say about it. And I think, I mean, people have heard me speak, have heard me say this before. I mean, if you look in uh, financial newspapers, you will see lots of advertisements by companies who say they are carbon neutral, climate neutral, emissions neutral, net zero, you name it they rarely mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. They rarely cover the same scopes of emissions or the same activities, and it's never clear whether they are above and beyond what companies should be doing or just a substitute. So we are going to, the VCMI will issue guidance, which we hope many companies will pilot, which will create some clear guidelines on what companies need to do first, what, what kind of credits they should be buying, what they can say about that, and how they, need to be, how they need to report and disclose that information. And I think this goes back to the key point about transparency. We, there, there, isn't, there aren't governments at the moment who are regulating those claims directly, although a number of governments are looking at how to manage environmental claims. But the public, the consumers, when you buy your yogurt that says it's carbon neutral or net zero, whatever it may be, you don't know what you're buying. So we need to be able to, as consumers, to have the tools to make that choice. And that's part of what VCMI is doing. And will it have teeth? Um, I hope so. Um, <laughs> it'll have teeth in, uh, well, we're aiming for it to have several sets of teeth. One will be through this emphasis on transparency so that you and others can scrutinise this and say this stands up and this doesn't. Um, we can see that a lot of governments around the world are looking to upgrade their rules on consumer protection and advertising to ensure that there aren't false claims. So we've been working with a group of governments to look at that and hope that what we produce or some version of it will make its way into consumer protection regulation as well. Um, and then, as we're, we've seen in some countries, companies are being sued over misleading claims. And um, that will be, should be another stick or carrot, depending how you look at it, 
to use the guidance properly and make the make robust claims. But how, how have we got to this situation? Because I know, Ariel, we were talking a bit about this last week. I, I got very confused by how some companies, and Nestle's, Nestle's done this um, in particular, you, you set a net, they set a net zero goal and say, we will not use carbon offsets to meet net zero. Um, but they then buy offsets <laughs> and claim and use them to count to the carbon neutrality of individual project, products, such as a bottle of water. I can't see the difference between net zero and carbon neutrality. Um, and I can't see how you can use offsets for one and not the other. But they claim that, uh, that neutrality, carbon neutrality and net zero is completely different. But to me, I, d I don't understand, and I write about this kind of thing, to the average guy on the street, he's definitely not going to get that. So how on earth have we got to this situation? I mean, the, the market is b bifurcating between avoidance and removal units. And you know, I, for, first, what I would say is most companies that have made net zero pledges do not have, have no idea how they're going to get there because it's impossible to know. It's literally impossible to know what the price and availability of certain technologies will be over time and what the carbon price will be and what budget. It's impossible to know, literally. So when they say we're not going to use offsets, I think that's a way to bolster the claim and to, you know, to, 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 to communicate that they intend the plan to be high integrity. Um, but the reality is we're not going to get to zero Right, without any offsetting activities in restoring nature and natural sinks and, 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 and eventually pricing in technology at well above $60, $60 a ton. So I think it is a near 0% chance that we're going to achieve net zero without some sort of market mechanism, whether they're carbon offsets or carbon removal units or technology, doesn't really matter. Um, we're going to get to minus 70, 80, 85, 90%, and that residual balance will have to be offset you know, because some emissions are just impossible to abate using the, the current technology, and we hope that changes. Uh, but it's impossible to know exactly where we're going to end up, what the slope of the curve is, and, you know, and, and how we're going to balance. But what's known is we will need to balance one way or another. I'd, I'd agree. I'd say you know, carbon credits are not a substitute Correct. for corporate action. And you know, you, you've got to actually put a, you're putting all the hard work in and looking how you're addressing your scope one, scope two emissions. You've got to do some, the decarbonisation first as part of the transition. You're right, you know, a lot of net zero strategies are being set and you don't know how they can get there without some form of offsetting at some point. So I think, you know, the work that you, you're doing is really great to help with the education of the corporates because that's where there is, you know, a lack of education, understanding, you know, you've got, you know, different sort of, you know, uh, offset requirements um, and is it removals, it, it, what, what sort of the options available? Um, and certainly we're seeing that when we're talking to some of the, the listed companies on our market because we actually see that what we're doing by the listing of funds opens up corporates to be investors in those funds. So it's going to be another way for companies to be able to procure offsets. You, know, you, can, list it, you can list and hold a share, hold it on a balance sheet, and in time those um, carbon credits will be released in the form of dividend in specie. So that can be retired or, you know, or held or you know, it can meet those... Um, those offset requirements. Yeah. Thanks. So I'm going to throw it open to the audience for the questions. I think Meg has them already. What happens to markets in the event of an extreme incident such as major forest fires that cause loss of permanence beyond the current uh, reserves built into the system? Does everyone have to buy their historic offsets again? I'll give that one to Mark. No. Well, I'll, I'll, no. I'll start the answer, <laughs> but I'd like to hear what yeah. the financial <laughs> markets think about it as well. I mean, at the moment, the main um, standards that deal in, in um, land use and forest-based offsets do have some sort of a, a mechanism normally called a buffer which deals with permanence so that there is, if there is a reversal either through a forest fire or pests or whatever it may be, then that buffer acts, acts as an insurance pool. It's a, um, and how much any given project has to put in that pool depends on some kind of risk assessment of the likelihood of pests or fires or whatever it may be. That obviously can't ever take into account a sort of catastrophic event of the type you're t t talking about. And that's where I think, well, ha this hasn't evolved, d developed properly over the last two decades. What is really needed is a finance-based risk management tool, a an insurance mechanism. Um, there's quite a lot of debate about when there is a reversal, who should bear the brunt of that? Is it the buyer who's responsible for replacing it because they bought a reversible credit and therefore should have known better? Or is the onus on the seller? And if, does the seller still exist? If it's a local community, how can they possibly do it? So I think that's a role where, you know, where financial markets have traditionally played a role and can continue to do so. I don't know what you, what you think about that. 
yeah, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's not, you know, an area that we've, you know, we've had to sort of address ourselves, you know, from a stock exchange perspective. But as you say, you know, it's about the, the broader financial markets, the banks, um, insurance having to look at that as a, how can you get a, a solution there. Um, and I think that that is something, if I'm thinking about the construct of what we're looking to do from a the fund perspective, then actually there, there's a debate there to be had between sort of the, the, the fund managers and how they, when they're building out their portfolio and the type of projects that they're looking at, that's something that's going to have to be incorporated in sort of, you know, the mission documents and perspectives and, and comes under sort of that, that risk assessment. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. Fundamentally, you lose the buffer, future supply is decreased, the owner of that project has a loss, but to the best of my knowledge, there's no clawback mechanism. Another one. Uh, geographically, if carbon offsets are concentrated in one region to offset emissions elsewhere, is that still acceptable? Should there be a rule that regions identified for carbon offsets should be evenly spread out on the planet? Well, I can start. I mean, <laughs> I, it depends how much you want to interfere with the operation of the market. I mean, I think well, we, the experience we saw under the Clean Development Mechanism and also with voluntary carbon projects in the last couple of decades is that they went tended to go pr primarily to larger countries but and larger and perhaps somewhat wealthier countries but there are obvious reasons for that because they're larger and so you can get bigger projects because they tend to have not always but tend to have more developed financial markets more develop, developed governance and insti insti governance systems and institutions so the risk for project developers and investors is much lower so I don't think necessarily saying you've got to have 10 projects in every single country whatever is going to work. What is needed is how in those countries that most need the carbon finance and are least capable of, of getting it at the moment, what do they need to be able to do that? Is there a role for multilateral development banks? Is there a role for governments, for aid funding, both in capacity building and training, but also perhaps underwriting some of the risks? And again, um, and I think you know, Ariel will be able to talk to this more, there is now more of a premium being put on projects that do have really verifiable, meaningful, um, sustainable development benefits that leave resources with the local community. And perhaps that's something that the market can drive as well um, and, and to support that. Completely. Carbon is just the base unit. And you know, it, my, my opinion is climate change is a global issue, so you need a global set of solutions. And that's what this voluntary market represents. It's more efficient. That's it for questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I have, I have one final question for each of you, same question, which is um, whether you think the voluntary carbon market will still exist in 10 years' time or whether you think it will have been folded into compliance markets or kind of given some kind of formal regulation. All right, I'll start. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I think the starting point for the answering that question is we only have a voluntary carbon market now because we have failed so spectacularly over the last two decades to deal with the problem of climate change. So you said I've been working on this for two decades. So I started just before the Kyoto Protocol, and we needed to make a 10 or 15% reduction in global emissions by 2010. We got 5% from the developed world only, and we've been successively further underperforming. So we've got a voluntary carbon market to, as a substitute almost for our inability to have rigorous policy, for an inability for many of us, and I count myself amongst, amongst those, to change our way of lives. I mean, I still have a footprint that's six or seven tons when, if we think in 2050, there's only half a ton each for everybody in the world yeah. within the removals. So will, will there be a voluntary carbon market in 10 years' time? I sincerely hope not. I suspect there will be. That's not to say, that's not because I don't believe it's the right thing to be doing. I just think we need to catch up. I mean, this needs to converge with other markets. It needs to be policy driven. There needs to be much more certainty for what companies are going to do and what governments are going to do. So it's vital now because we know that in the next 10 years, and as we keep being told, this is the decade where we, we, we win or lose the battle on climate change. So we need to do everything we can as quickly as we can, and carbon markets can play a role in that. But they're not the long term answer. Ariel? I completely agree. I mean, we, we price somewhere between 20 and 25% of the world's carbon in compliance carbon markets or tax regimes, 25%. So the scope today for the voluntary market is the remaining 75%. And the only reason it exists is because that 25 is not higher. So even if you get a doubling of carbon pricing, it's still 50% of emissions that are unpriced. And really the only mechanism that I'm aware of that even provides an incentive 
to start making investments above and beyond just seeking profit is the voluntary carbon market. So I think pretty much close to 100% chance we're going to have the voluntary market or something that is a derivative of the current market trying to address those unpriced emissions. And I think the chance that the whole world comes together and puts in a global cap and trade system and we stick to it and we go to, to zero in 2050 at a 3% linear reduction factor is near zero. It's unfortunate, but you know, what we've that, that's how we got to where we are. Um, and in a way, it's a little bit, it's, 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 it's strange because the word voluntary makes it feel not serious. But as you've heard from you know, Burberry earlier today, when you make a pledge, and you go public, and you're a public company, and you're regulated, you can't just walk that back. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's almost easier, because you can't lobby yourself out of this when you've made the pledge yourself publicly. <laughs> so that's it. I mean, you know, we're, we're on the journey. Um, a lot needs to be done. Uh, but I think the voluntary carbon market and, and the broader environmental commodity market kind of ecosystem has a major role to play, not just in reducing carbon, but saving biodiversity, promoting sustainable development, um, everything, all of these other externalities and, 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 and things that are great for the world that are currently unpriced. And this is the mechanism. Last word to you, Claire. Look, I, do I think you know, there's going to be more regulation brought into it? I mean, yes, because you know, that is exactly what we are going to do. But there's others that are doing that as well in different parts of the market. But I think you, know, you made some really good you know, points that I, I think when we were looking at this and thinking, voluntary, is this really voluntary? It doesn't <laughs> feel like it's voluntary, yeah. actually. We do need, you know, we've got one planet. We heard previous speakers saying that we've all got, you know, to work together to make sure that we are, um, that we, we, we keep, you know, our, our planet for generations to come. Um, and so actually, we've got to make action um, and, and, with, and facilitating it, I think, through sort of offsetting seems a solution today, but will it be in the future? Somebody will come up with some other greater idea, I think, and we'll be sitting here discussing that. Let's hope so. Or maybe we won't be, but somebody, <laughs> others will be. Okay, Claire, Mark, Ariel, thank you very much for thank joining you. us.